After months of waiting, the day is finally here. This is the all new Grand Highlander and I am driving it around the big island of Hawaii today. I will apologize in advance for the wind noise that you'll probably be hearing in this video. It is very, very windy out here. Now this is not just the grandest Highlander as its name would imply. Having more power, more size, more opulence, more features, etc. than you'll find in the regular Highlander, it's also quite simply one of the best three row crossovers or SUVs in America. It has a lot of room inside and not one, but two different hybrid systems under the hood. So whether you want 360 horsepower with four cylinder like fuel economy, or you're after the best fuel economy in the big SUV segment, you want to take a look at the Grand Highlander. In addition to being the biggest Highlander, I think this is also the most attractive. Rather than the more organic flowing design that we find in the smaller Highlander, this adopts more of a boxy upright theme. You'll notice that the hood is definitely taller, the front end is definitely blunter, and the angles and design is definitely more aggressive. It honestly doesn't share much design with the regular Highlander up front. Instead, it's a blend of maybe RAV4 and some of the rest of Toyota's crossover lineup around the world. We get aggressive LED headlights up front, big chrome bar that connects all the way from one side to the other, really accentuating the width of the vehicle, and then LED fog lights below. Although I am filming this video on a mild off-road trail, there's no off-road edition of the Grand Highlander yet. All versions do get eight inches of ground clearance, which is pretty respectable, but no model will have skid plates or all-terrain tires from the factory like you will find on a Pilot Trail Sport. Also an interesting twist, there's no sporty version of the Grand Highlander, so no XSE trim. The lineup is XLE, Limited, and Platinum, essentially. Highlander. It's over 200 inches long with an over 116. No, no, no. Shit. Shit. Well, look at that. The wind died down and the Grand Highlander turned red. Just kidding. This is a turbocharged model without the hybrid system. Today in Hawaii, I have been able to drive all three drivetrains that are going to be available in the Grand Highlander, but I'll talk about that a little bit more in the drive section. From the side, you'll notice that the Grand Highlander is definitely grander than the regular model. It is significantly longer, almost 202 inches long and definitely boxier, not just up there in the hood area, but most importantly, boxy back here in the rear passenger and cargo area as well. We also have a little bit more glass going on back here than you find in the regular Highlander. This is certainly much more focused on third row and second row comfort than the smaller version. We have a wheelbase that's over 116 inches long, and that has also resulted in additional passenger room on the inside, and a nice touch that I appreciate, especially after having recently been in my own Durango, where the hatch does not open very far, you can see that taller people would have no problem keeping their head away from the opening on that hatch. It is definitely nice and high. As with the front end styling, the rear end styling is a bit more RAV4 and international market Toyota than it is the regular Highlander in the US. And who knows, maybe there's going to be an additional Highlander model in the future, maybe a Highlander Sport, something along those lines. We have a small spoiler up here on top, sort of a spoilerette with a very long LED third brake light inside and the taillight modules, those are full LEDs. Interesting twist, no visible exhaust tips, they're tucked up under the bumper there, gives it a really clean look. Also, a very vertical rear end theme is going on here. This upper portion of the hatch sticks out just about as far as the bumper cover at the bottom. From this angle, you'll also notice the sort of wide hip stance that we find in the Grand Highlander. The result of that is that the body is about two inches wider than the regular Highlander, but in the third row, it's not quite an additional two inches of interior room, especially up here by your head. If you were hoping the Grand Highlander would give you more cylinders under the hood, you will be disappointed. If on the other hand, you simply wanted more power, you will be pleasantly surprised because the Grand Highlander is available with up to 362 horsepower and 400 pound-feet of torque. That's the new Hybrid Max system. It basically uses this turbocharged engine plus a six-speed transmission and an electric motor to get this baby zero to 60 in about six seconds. 6.3 according to Toyota, but in my testing at 3,000 feet of elevation, 6.2 seconds. So definitely quick for a big three-row crossover. If you want to be more efficient, there's the regular hybrid system borrowed out of the regular Highlander, producing 243 horsepower, about 250 pound-feet of torque, zero to 60 times, maybe about 8.5 seconds. But you will get 36 miles per gallon in the front wheel drive trim, 33 miles per gallon in the top end all wheel drive trim, significantly better than any of the competition. The 2.4 liter turbocharged hybrid that is gonna be lower, 27 miles per gallon combined. The base engine is still pretty hardy, 265 horsepower out of the same 2.4 liter turbo in the top end version, only without the electric motor. And instead of the six speed auto, we find an eight speed automatic under this hood. Zero to 60 times splits the difference at around seven and a half seconds and fuel economy at 24 miles per gallon is still better than a Kia Telluride. 
Front seat comfort in the Grand Highlander is very similar to the regular Highlander because these seats are almost the same. We have the same sort of adjustability over here on the driver's side with just a two-way lumbar support, even though this is the top-end platinum trim. What's more surprising about that is that the new Tacoma is actually going to get a four-way adjustable lumbar support on the passenger side as well. We have a manual tilt telescopic steering column with a decent range of motion and two-position driver's seat memory over there on the doors. The second row is where things really start to diverge from the smaller Highlander. I have tons of legroom back here. This front seat's actually a little further back than I would normally sit, but I still have about six or seven inches of legroom and about an inch and a half of headroom, even though this model has the optional panoramic boonroof. You will find a bit more headroom in the models without that feature. The second row seats are also more comfortable than the ones we find in the regular Highlander. They're definitely more thickly padded. You can actually see if I scoot this seat forward, how much thicker the seat back cushion is itself. A lot of padding going on. In this version, they're also ventilated here in the second row. Lots of recline. You can see the amount of recline there. And the recline mechanism happens at about the same point in the seat back as with the front seats. So it's still very comfortable. You can get the Grand Highlander as either a seven or an eight passenger vehicle. So the top end trims are gonna have two captain's chairs right here in the middle with an interesting feature, this removable center console module, which has two cup holders in there. Personally, I would have preferred a removable center seat like we find in the Pilot that is still one advantage in the Honda. But the big advantage for the Grand Highlander is actually back there in the third row. Despite the regular Highlander's best-selling status, it's never had a particularly large third row. It's really been more of a pragmatic third row than anything. But things are very different back here in the Grand Highlander. I have tons of room. Let's move this second row seat all the way back in its tracks, tilt it back to a comfortable position, which is, interestingly enough, exactly where the seat lands if you aren't pulling on anything. You can even recline it a bit more and still have a decent amount of room back here. But in this position, the second row is very comfortable. Gobs of legroom up there in the first row and still about an inch and a half of legroom back here because this now has the most legroom in this segment. In fact, if you want more combined legroom than in a Grand Highlander, you'll be looking at a minivan or a full-size SUV. But a little bit more like a full-size SUV versus a Honda Pilot is the position of this seat bottom cushion. It is definitely higher off the ground, certainly making this back seat much more comfortable than the Pilot seat. Now, interesting thing about specs. You would assume that the Pilot might be more comfortable because it has more headroom back here in the third row. And indeed, you will find a bit more head clearance. If I put my head back here at six feet tall, all the way against that headrest, my hair is just barely brushing the ceiling. It could barely squeeze a little bit between my head and the ceiling top but the seat bottom cushion is the big thing for me. If you were say six foot four and you didn't mind your knees in your chest, yes, the pilot would be a bit more comfortable, but for the average adult or the average teenager, this back seat is certainly gonna be better. Now we do still have three across seating in the way back here. So this middle passenger, it's not gonna be all that comfy, but we do have a headrest. And of course we have a seat belt that comes out of the ceiling for that person right there. When it comes to the child seat anchors, there's one set of latch anchors over here on the passenger side in the third row, and then latch anchors for the outboard second row seats. Third row passengers get USB-C charge points integrated into these handles that make getting in and out of the third row a little bit easier. This is where the roller style cargo cover would dock if you have the third row folded. Then we have big cup holders on either side. The armrests back here, although they are a different color, they're still hard plastic, so no soft touch points there because a lot of folks really are gonna have those third row seats folded most of the time. You can see the easy access release from the third row, so you don't have to grab there on top of that seat back, although you could do either. And then up here on the ceiling, we find the air vents for the third row. Behind the power hatch, we find 20.6 cubic feet of storage space. This is not, in fact, the largest in the segment, although it is somewhat close. The Telluride will give you about 21 cubic feet of storage space, and the new Pilot will give you some additional storage space under its load floor. This is, on the other hand, one of the widest cargo areas in this segment. In my rough measuring out here, mind you, without a tape measure, but we do have some other measuring objects, it appears to be about 49 or 50 inches wide across the rear looks like it's a little bit over 48 inches wheel well to wheel well. So you should be able to fit four by sheet goods in here, making this one of the more convenient cargo areas available. Also, if I take my bag out of here, under this floor, we find a novelty for a lot of vehicles these days. We find a temporary spare tire under here. We also have a place to store the roller cargo cover, but weirdly enough, there's no place to dock the roller cargo cover back here behind the third row. It's only intended to be used if the third row seats are folded. Some of you might not like the lack of a power folding third row, but I find it pretty easy to pull them back up into place, and certainly they'll move faster than those power mechanisms. 
On the inside of the Platinum trim, you can see that we have slightly different contrasting piping and stitching going on in the upper section of the seat. The center section is an imitation suede product. These seats are ventilated as well as heated, and the second row in this model is also ventilated. Moving over to the dashboard, very similar shapes going on, slightly different trim. This has sort of a geometric pattern in it. It's a little bit difficult to see right there. And then we have bronze accents over there around the air vent. Same stitch section going on right there. Same large infotainment system in the middle of the dashboard, but then we have the controls for the ventilated front seats there. Down here in the center console area, more bronze accents going on there for the joystick style shifter. This is the hybrid max drivetrain in this model, and this is what the uh, different controller looks like here. We get normal mode, mud and sand, rock and dirt, sport and eco modes right there. Moving over to the driver's side, we have that full color heads up display right there in the middle of the dashboard, and then basically the same full color LCD instrument cluster we find in a variety of different trims. The steering wheel has basically the same design with the bronze accents on either side, and then the driver monitoring system is located right here. This has some IR cameras and transmitters to monitor the eye motions of the driver, and if you're distracted, like say you had a camera right in front of your face and you were driving along, it would tell you to start paying attention to the road. It's time for the moment you've all been waiting for. Let's get the Grand Highlander out on the road. First up, this hybrid max drivetrain it is definitely very swift. Even up here at over 3,000 feet of elevation, if you floor it, you'll get some front wheel slip and you'll go zero to 60 in about 6.2 seconds. That's actually a little bit faster than Toyota's quoted time of 6.3 seconds and theoretically that's supposed to be at sea level. This hybrid max system actually gives us a little bit more torque on the front axle than the Volvo setup, but performance is obviously gonna be better in the Volvo because it has a bigger battery pack and more powerful motor in the rear. But the fact that we're talking about a Toyota hybrid system and a Volvo hybrid system in the same sentence tells you something about the power and the refinement that we find in this system. But there are a few things to know. This is not gonna feel like the regular hybrid system in the Highlander or the one that's available in the Grand Highlander as well. This has those dedicated automatic transmission shifts. You will certainly wait for that shifting a little bit if you're driving this more aggressively, say out on a road like this, you have to wait for the transmission to shift. But also we have more torque on the rear axle and a more powerful electric motor back there. This system also uses the rear motor differently than in the regular hybrid setup. So the result is this feels more engaging, more sporty, but also a bit more traditional at the same time. If you're looking for the smoothest hybrid system in this segment, that would be the base system in the Grand Highlander. It uses Toyota's planetary power split technology, and it doesn't have any shifts to interrupt the power flow. So it just feels a little bit more like perhaps an electric vehicle or a vehicle with a CVT in that respect. But this is certainly gonna be the more fun and more engaging option because of the amount of power it's gonna to send to the rear and how often it's gonna do it. Now on Toyota's spec sheet, it again says you could send 80% of power to the rear axle, but that's not gonna be all the time. At low speeds, yes, it will do that. Say you're off-roading and you need a little bit more oomph in the back, it can definitely do that. But at higher speeds, if I floor it here, obviously most of the power is happening up front because that's where the bigger engine is. I don't have official 60 to zero stopping distances just yet, but in my unofficial testing here in Hawaii, I stopped in 122 feet. That's a solid score given the weight and the tire size we find on the Grand Highlander. Keep in mind, we have over 350 horsepower in this vehicle, but this is not as overtly sporty as say an Explorer ST or a Dodge Durango SRT. That's not the mission of the Grand Highlander with the hybrid system. It's best to think of this hybrid Mac system as a V6 replacement, perhaps a twin turbo V6 replacement. So 27, 26 miles per gallon average is what I've been seeing so far out here. That obviously is not as good as the regular hybrid system, but compared to a twin turbo six, say in the Ford Explorer, this is definitely more fuel efficient. A number of you were asking me how this compares to the new Mazda CX-90 over on our Facebook page. The comparison seems natural because both models are pretty new. Both models have hybrid systems. It's actually standard over there on the CX-90 and the CX-90 is on the large side of this segment. Now, because of the CX-90's design, it actually has about the same kind of interior room as a regular Highlander. That's probably the most important thing to know. The next most important thing to know is that its hybrid system is just not as smooth as any of the Toyota hybrid systems, despite its design being somewhat similar to this hybrid Max system. That system produces about 340 horsepower, but it takes a little bit longer to go from zero to 60 versus this because of the way it's applying the power. Also, just due to the system's design, it doesn't have a torque converter. Uh, it has to actually slip the clutch a little bit to get the vehicle started. It has a fairly small electric motor to help things out, but the clutch still has to shift in order to get you moving. 
It doesn't feel as buttoned down as this. It can feel herky-jerky in stop and go traffic, and this system absolutely does not. That may be because of the bigger electric motor in the rear, which can also help get the vehicle started in addition to what's going on up front. Now out on your favorite winding mountain road, obviously the rear wheel drive dynamics of the CX-90 are gonna become apparent, but the Grand Highlander is no slouch. And again, with this hybrid max setup and that more powerful electric motor in the rear, it can do things that the regular Highlander hybrid system cannot do. As far as ride quality goes, even out on a rougher road like this one, the Grand Highlander does very well. It's empty at the moment. It would be actually a little bit softer if we had more people in the back, but this is one of the more comfortable options, just as you'd expect out of the biggest Highlander available. In addition to ride quality being on the supple side of this segment, cabin isolation is also very good. The cabin is certainly quieter out on a rougher road like this or out on the open highway versus the regular Highlander. It's apparent that Toyota spent a bit more time on the sound deadening in this model, and I wouldn't be surprised if this ended up being one of the quieter options in the three row segment. Now to the question so many of you have been asking, how much grander is the price tag on the Grand Highlander than the regular Highlander? Well, not as grand as the Grand Cherokee, I will tell you that. $43,070 is the base trim. And keep in mind, the Grand Highlander only comes in XLE limited and platinum trims. So there's no corollary to the base version of the regular Highlander. But this is only about $1,000 more than a Highlander XLE front wheel drive. And for that extra $1,000, you get a notable increase in terms of interior dimensions, not too big of a hit on fuel economy. I think that is perfectly acceptable. I also think a more attractive design inside and out. Now, Direct feature comparisons are a little bit tricky because there are a few feature differences between the Highlander and Grand Highlander, but they're fairly minor. It's essentially a $1,000 upgrade. If you want all-wheel drive, it's a $1,600 upgrade on top of the base model, or you could choose the hybrid front-wheel drive for that same extra $1,600. Extra $1,600 after the hybrid gets you a hybrid all-wheel drive. Pretty simple lineup. The limited trim is $47,860. You get real leather upholstery instead of the imitation leather upholstery. You get the full LCD instrument cluster rather than a partial LCD cluster. But the big infotainment system, that's standard in all the trims. You also get ventilated front seats. But if you want ventilated rear seats, then you have to step all the way up to the platinum trim, which starts at $53,545. If you're looking for the fastest three-row crossover for the price, then you definitely want the Hybrid Max drivetrain, which is priced kind of interestingly. The Hybrid Max in limited trim, which is one step below this Platinum, is $54,040, only about $500 more than this exact Platinum right next to me. For the money, I would probably get the Hybrid Max with a few fewer features inside. You still get the ventilated seats up front, you still get the big LCDs in the dashboard, but you lose a few things that are somewhat inconsequential to me. You lose the panoramic moonroof, you lose the ventilated second row seats. I think I would give those up to get 360 some odd horsepower under the hood. Of course, if you want everything, then you want the Platinum Hybrid Max for 58,125. Still a fairly narrow pricing range. But by the time you've worked your way up to the Platinum trims, this is gonna be about $2,000 more expensive than a Platinum regular Highlander because we do have more feature content inside. Now versus the competition, that's where things get a little bit tricky. A Honda Pilot is obviously the most direct competitor to the Grand Highlander. It has grown significantly over the last few years and it is now about the same size as this on the inside. We get significantly more leg room in the Grand Highlander, but by the numbers, we get a little bit less rear headroom. Now for me, I found the rear seats in this to still be more comfortable than the ones in the Pilot because the seat bottom cushion is higher off the ground. And one of the ways that the Pilot gets to that really tall headroom figure in the third row is by slamming those seats all the way to the floor. So it may not look like it, but these third row seats are definitely more comfortable than we find in the Pilot. And the interior width dimensions are also a bit roomier, especially in the second row area and the front passenger compartment versus what we find in the Pilot. This is one of those areas where you really need to sit in this versus the Pilot to really be able to tell the difference. Sometimes the numbers aren't the best way to look at that because of exactly where and how those numbers are measured. But this is gonna be a little bit more expensive than average. Not much more than the Pilot, but still a little bit more expensive. Bear in mind, of course, that by the time you've worked your way all the way up to the top, you will either get a 33 mile per gallon all wheel drive hybrid in the top end platinum, or this 27 mile per gallon, 360 some odd horsepower hybrid, which is gonna be way faster than the Pilot 
and still more fuel efficient. Really the interesting twist with the Grand Highlander is that you could consider this top end hybrid max system almost a no compromises hybrid. You get the best performance in the segment while also one of the best fuel economy figures because at the moment there is no hybrid to compete with anything outside of the Highlander lineup. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below and if your cash was on the line would you buy the grandest of Highlanders? Would you just step down to the regular Highlander which still has a very usable second row and a decent but not overly luxurious third row or do you want the extra room that we get in this model? Even if you don't use the third row it's going to have a much bigger cargo area in the back. Or would you prefer something like that Honda Pilot, which does have that really novel removable middle seat in the second row, so you can do seven or eight your choice. With this, by the time you've worked your way up to the top, it's just gonna be a seven seater. Let me know all that down there in the comment section, and of course stay tuned because I should have one of these at home for a complete review over the next few months. See all of you later.